number of states have recently adopted policies that focus on the use of structured English immersion, immersion or SEI, um, as the preferred or, in some cases, virtually the only uh, um, program for students who are English learners. Structured English immersion actually has been used in a, a lot of different ways, and there is no single uh, form of structured English immersion. For example, Arizona has taken on what they call structured English immersion and turned that into a four-hour block of just basically English drill. Um, others uh, use uh, other forms, but primarily the idea is that the student is uh, immersed in English and the English is at least theoretically uh, provided in some kind of a structured format that allows the student to learn English as they're learning other things. Um, well, structured English immersion that assumes that students are going to learn English first and then they're going to learn content later um, assumes that English is going to come very rapidly and that therefore students aren't going to lose a lot of time in their learning because, as this has been written into a number of these state laws, that the children will learn it normally in, quote, one year. Well, that doesn't happen. I mean, there is absolutely no evidence that um, <clears throat> most or even many children can learn English uh, in, to, at a level that allows them to be competitive in the classroom with English speakers uh, in one year. And in fact, Arizona's own data, um, and I mention Arizona because they have one of the strictest laws right now, uh, show that at best, at best, um, half of the children were not learning in one year. Um, and really, more typically, it takes kids about, you know, depending on where they start and all that. There, there are many, uh, many variables. But uh, we could say that on average, most children will have pretty good fluency in spoken English in three years or four years. But academic understanding of English, the ability to use that in the classroom with academic topics and texts, that generally takes kids quite a lot longer, six, seven, eight years. In 1992, a, a case was begun in Arizona by a little girl named Miriam Flores, who I believe was in the fourth grade at that time. And it was a class action suit on behalf of Miriam and other children. Uh, in her similar situation, and they claimed that the Nogales School District and the state of Arizona actually had not provided adequately for them in their education and that they were in fact being left behind. Um, the argument that they made was fundamentally that not enough resources were being applied to these programs to actually provide a good education for the kids. But that case traveled through the federal court and back and forth for really two decades. Finally, in 2009, we got a Supreme Court decision. And that Supreme Court decision is known as Hornby Flores because um, uh, um, Superintendent of Public Instruction Horn was actually the person in the seat at the time. And this decision is a very, very troubling decision. Um, basically, the Supreme Court agreed with the state of Arizona that they had done enough in providing a structured English immersion program for the students. And this was a very troubling decision because uh, the court basically said that Arizona had done enough, um, that the federal court was really outside its bounds in requiring that they spend more money because, after all, money is not necessarily related to quality of programming. And um, that's an interesting finding. Um, the court also noted that one reason that they were finding Arizona to be in compliance at this point is with the Equal Educational Opportunity Act was because they were now using this uh, structured English immersion program which the court considered to be superior to other forms of instruction. Something that also um, is a very interesting finding given that there is virtually no research that finds that. Um, 
And I would say that probably the most important and the most troubling aspect of the court's decision was the way in which it decoupled resources from uh, program quality. And so now going forward, not only for English learners, but for other children seeking equity in their education, it's going to be harder to do because um, the court did not accept the idea that if you're not spending any money on a program, it suggests that you may not really be providing a really good program. There were other issues in there, however, and those went back to the federal court for clarification, and we recently got a federal court decision on those. And among those issues was the quality of the structured English immersion, and was it really uh, doing what it needed to do for these children. The court concurred uh, with the state that it was just fine, and <clears throat> it was okay for children to be in a classroom segregated from all of their English-speaking classmates and given this intensive English instruction to the exclusion of the regular curriculum. And that we find a great deal of difficulty with because it is absolutely certain, and the court even mentioned, uh, mentioned in passing that some children would indeed be left behind because they're not having access to the regular curriculum. This really calls into question how the court interprets the Lau decision, which said that all children need to have access to the regular curriculum. Structured English immersion, which uh, can also be framed as a sequential program, you know, suggests that the children can learn English quickly and then quickly get into the regular curriculum. And I believe that the assumption in this kind of sequential instruction is that um, the children will somehow make up all that has been lost. But in fact, there is no programming in any of the states that have adopted this that allows the children additional time and instruction to make up what they have lost. And this, given the great national concern right now about achievement gaps, this can do nothing but widen those achievement gaps with no remedy for closing them. I believe that the recent decision has been disastrous for both equity and opportunity to learn. One of the things that the court does not seem to have weighed is that um, children who come to school in this country speaking another language, usually that other language is Spanish, not always, but usually in about three quarters of the cases. And these children are overwhelmingly, at least two thirds of them, are living in poverty. Their families have lower and oftentimes much, much lower average education among the parents. And so the children come to school in, a, in an educationally disadvantaged situation. And we know that uh, when we look at the data on entering kindergartners across the nation, uh, we've been collecting these data now at the U.S. Department of Education, and we can say with absolute clarity that these English learners begin school significantly behind their, uh, their peers. So there's already a big gap at the beginning of school. That gap is largely the product of poverty and isolation, isolation and, uh, and living in communities where they don't hear English and therefore are not exposed to the mainstream uh, discourse. So if you begin school behind and then you're put into a program that will put you further behind because you don't have equitable access to the regular curriculum and you don't have, as in the case of Arizona, access to other children who speak English and who are from the mainstream, uh, this creates a very, very serious equity problem for English learners. The thing I would like to mention about this decision is that it is not over yet. Um, the decision will be appealed and we will continue to uh, work with those advocates for English learners who are trying to get them a more equitable education. So we don't give up so easily. Um, but in the meantime, and given the circumstances that exist, how can parents, and, uh, well, how can parents help advocate for their children? 
I would say that certainly parents need to make their voice heard. They need to, parents can opt out of these programs as well. So that's always an option. Now, you, uh, many parents are not going to want to opt out of something in order to get nothing. But parents can organize to ask for an alternative kind of program. And more and more we've seen this going on, for example, in California. That parents just saying, we want something other than this. So parents can exercise their voice. They can exercise their rights to have a different kind of education for their children. Um, I think another thing that it's good to be aware of is that children need to have contact with the mainstream. And so parents should be seeking those opportunities for their children to be in contact with children who are English learners, whether it's advocating that the school requiring that in the other two hours a day while the children are still there, that they be mixed in a meaningful way with other kids, um, or if it's in after school and out of school kinds of circumstances where the children can be in contact with, uh, with mainstream kids, that, that would be helpful as well. There are programs that um, have been effective in teaching parents how to advocate for their kids. One of those programs, I have, you know, I don't own any stock in them, so I, I'm not mentioning this because I have any particular bias. I've simply worked with them and seen that they're very effective. Is PIKE, Parent Institute for Quality Education, which goes into schools and actually teaches parents how to advocate for their kids. And I think programs like that are very powerful in helping parents. The other thing I would say to all parents of, uh, of any language background is read to your kids or have them read to you in the language of the home. Don't try to do this. If you don't speak English, don't do it in English. Do it in whatever language is the language of the home. Because one of the things that the data show us, that the research has shown, is that if you are a good reader in any language, your chances of doing well in school are very, very good. So read with your kids. If you don't read, then have your children read to you. Just sit down with a book, go to the library, make a trip to the library whenever you can, and expose your children to reading. Out of 10 children in this country is at any, at any given moment an English learner. In reality that means that many more children in this country, you know, up to 20 percent, up to one out of five children is or has been an English learner uh, in our schools. This is a huge portion of our population. In some states like in Texas and uh, in California, in Nevada, New Mexico, um, in some states this is the overwhelming largest group in the state. And now in California, and I believe this year in Texas as well, they are the majority of all students in the state. Um, Latinos are. About half of them are English learners. So it's huge. It's about 20 to 25 percent of all the kids uh, in, in some of these areas. If we don't figure out how to educate these children well, it will have consequences for everyone for every single person in, in these regions, in these states, and ultimately in the country. Because our economy can't work with, under -edu with large portions of undereducated kids. And our social structure, our, our society can't work like that with large portions of the young people really isolated from the mainstream. So we have got to figure out how to make this work. We've got to figure out how to provide a good education that doesn't continue to increase the achievement gaps for these children uh, for the good of everybody in this country.